Hi everybody, welcome to today's edition of the CrossFit Games Update Show. I'm Sean Woodland with Tommy Marquez and Pat Sherwood. We are back from Carson, California and the 2016 Reebok CrossFit Games after having crowned the fittest man and woman and team on earth. And on the men's side, Matt Fraser comes in with the most dominant performance that we have seen from an individual ever. I mean, this guy was on fire from the beginning all the way to the final event. Yeah, Sean, from the first event Wednesday to the final event on Sunday, he held on to first place to start and finish every single day. You see the red line there, that's his overall placement, and the blue line is his event finish in each event. Look at that red line, it's basically at the top, every single event except for one. After Friday morning workout in Murph, he had a 78 point lead uh, over Josh Bridges, yeah. who was second at, at that time. After that point, there was never a single athlete that was within 100 points of him. That means at any given time throughout the rest of the competition, he could walk out, take a zero on the workout, and still walk back to the athlete area in first place. What a wonderful place to be. Traditionally, whoever wins, they have highs, they have lows. You know, that graph would look much different. <clears throat> they make some money, they lose some money. Matt Frazier said, hey, you know what? I think I finally figured it out. I'm just going to be <laughs> exceptional at everything. <laughs> and that way, I don't have to play that game anymore. And I just keep a lead. And every time I walk out on the floor, I just build and I build mm -hmm. and I build. And I mean, what a fantastic victory yeah. start to finish. He was ridiculous. Let's have a little fun here with a hypothetical. Of course, everyone talks about Rich Froning, and rightfully so. He's the most dominant male athlete that we've seen over a period of time. But Matt Fraser just turned into the most dominant performance that we've seen. Froning gets him in two categories. Fraser gets two categories here. If you take Matt Fraser, the best we've seen him, which was this past week, put him up against the best we've seen Rich Froning, put them in the games together, who comes out on top? Uh, I, just to start, I'm gonna go with Matt Frazier. You look at the total points, Frazier had more. Well, there are actually few, 100 points fewer available to him than when Rich got his 1089. The total wins for Rich, he's got an edge on him, five in 2014, but remember, he needed those wins to beat Matt Frazier. And the average event finish, uh, in 2011 for Rich Gotham, there were only 26,000 people participating at the time. There are more than 10 times that competing for Matt Fraser now, so I'm definitely giving the edge to Matt. You're stirring the pot with this one. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna bite, yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna say Fraser as well. I just think he was so dominant, it was incredible, and of those statistics that you just saw, the two that jumped out at me is uh, Froning's average event placement of 5.2 back in 2011, and then you've got Fraser, excuse me, he was 5.2 and 5.2 again for Fraser now in 2016. But I think the biggest difference is it's 2016. Yeah. And every year there's such a huge advancement in what the athletes are capable of. So for Matt to be able to do that now and to amass a 197 point lead mm -hmm. on Ben Smith. Yeah. He was this dominant against Ben Smith who had a great game right. and was never close to winning that I think you have to give it to him. Yeah, even though Ben Smith wasn't close to winning, he once again finished on the podium. Smith finishes in second place and continues to just rack up the milestones in what has already been a very impressive career. Since his rookie year in 2009, when he finished 64th, he has never finished lower than 11th at the games. He has been on the podium four times, and of course, he has won the CrossFit Games. And I know I used this term last week, and I think some other people did too, but when you talk about the, you know, the Mount Rushmore CrossFit, I mean, this guy has to be on it. He's definitely on the Mount Rushmore of male CrossFitters for me, and I think his 2016 performance just kind of reinforced that. If you look back uh, to last year, he had he had uh, 800, uh, sorry, 915 points. Well, Ben's point total this year was only 16 points lower than that. That's only two and a half placings across the entirety of the weekend. So really, points-wise, he's almost identical to what he did last year, which was a championship year, and was unprecedented in terms of top tens and consistency across the board. So his second place finish is nothing to sneeze at because he came in second under historical yeah. uh, terms, at least. You mentioned the word consistency, and a guy who just continues to really define that is Scott Panchik. He's been to the games now five times, never finished lower than sixth place. But what has made him so good, despite the fact that he hasn't gotten on the podium yet? He's, he is just so consistent, but he just needs just yeah. a, a smidge more. He's the fittest man to never stand on the podium, and it's a shame. And I'm not counting him out by any stretch. If you look over the last few years of his career, each year he averages your 12.2, 12.4, 11.8, he's always around that average event placement of 12, but you look at somebody like Matt Fraser, whose average event placement was 5.2, and you can just see the guys just ahead of him are just that good, squeaking out a little bit better placements than him. He's one of the smartest athletes out there. When I talked to him on the phone, he said to get on the podium, he needed to take a few chances at the games and have a damn near perfect race. 
and that race wasn't quite perfect. He had a 27th on the plow, a 28th on the trail run, and when the guys ahead of you aren't doing that, it's just costing Scott a little bit. Well, another guy that really impressed me this year, uh, we were kind of a little bit more focused on him after his performance yeah. last year was Bjorgman Carl Glumensen. Not that it needed any sort of validation of sorts, but his eighth place finish really kind of reinforces his spot on the podium last year to some of the people that may have doubted him. Another strong finish in Murph fifth put him as high as fourth place overall throughout the entirety of the weekend. And a sixth place in the 100% event put him hunting down the top five going into the final day. But some of the things that we kind of had knocks on him last mm -hmm. year for, which was barbell cycling and kind of heavy barbell loading, we still kind of walk away with some of those same questions. A 31st place finish in double DT, those are the kind of finishes that ultimately you look back on, you're like, you know what, that's why I wasn't yeah. in the top five. For the first time since 2007, we had a Canadian man on the podium, but it wasn't the Canadian rookie we thought it would be. We, we knew Brent Fikowski was going to be impressive. He was, we'll get to him in a second, but you know, Patrick Veller comes in and, and finishes in third place, and he was working with an injury too. He still had that you know, residual effects from that torn biceps that he suffered during regionals, but what impressed you the most about him? I mean, Patrick Vellner's 2016 season was nothing short of spectacular. I mean, just from a macro level, third place at the games as a rookie. The only two men fitter than you on this planet right now are Ben Smith and Matt Fraser. We take a deeper look as to how he did it. 11 top 10 finishes, a trio of top threes in the ranch, the ranch chipper, which is a four minute workout. Then he had a top three in the snail, which is an 11 minute workout. Some legless hybrid style rope climbs and odd object. Then then the rope chipper, which was a seven minute workout, multi, uh, multi, multitude of time domains with all sorts of different stuff. He out dev lifted Brent, uh, Ben Smith and Matt Fraser. And then situational awareness to close out the games in the final event, he beats Bjorgvin in a foot race to the finish mat. It would beat him by a tenth of a second. And in the end, it was that tenth of a second that got him his podium spot just two points ahead of Fikowski. And Brent Fikowski goes out and has a great week at the CrossFit Games. He sets the record for wins by a rookie with four. What though kept him, you know, off the podium ultimately? Well, those event wins help, but he just didn't have that consistency. You know, we saw the Fraser graphic a while ago and it just was this beautiful, almost flat line. But man, Fikowski was high, then he was low, he was up, then he was down. Had those four event wins. And out of the 15 events at the games, seven times he was in the top three, but then he'd punt some into the stands as well. But he's just a rookie. He's got so much potential. He's always had this fantastic engine. He said that his strength wasn't at the level of his mm -hmm. peers. He's developed, developed that, but now he can show his true potential. And man, he's just an interesting bird. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, of all the people that we chat with mm -hmm. all the time, I hung up the phone with him and I was just like, I just, all, just kind of processed it mm -hmm. in my head. It's like, his, his take on things is interesting. He's very cerebral. You know, nothing's mm -hmm. left to chance. And I think he has got a very, very bright future ahead of him. Every year at the games, there are, there are surprises, whether they be good or bad. Let's start on the negative and we'll end positive. But who are some athletes that you expected to do better? Well, for me, it's Josh Bridges. He took 13th this year, and that speaks to his talent as an athlete. That 13th is considered a less than ideal finish. But after one of the marquee moments of the weekend in Murph, where he won, moved into second place, he really just struggled to find consistency the rest of the way out. Eight of the next 10 were outside of the top 10, five were outside of the top 20, and it wasn't for lack of will or heart. That save in the clean ladder was one of the yeah. most impressive things I've ever seen. But as the weekend wore on, he just couldn't find the success that he had in some of the earlier events, like Murph, like in the 7K trail run, and ultimately, it just slowly moved him outside of the top 10. And then I'd have to say Noah Olson was another one. He was just kind of off this weekend. Phenomenal athlete. The last two years in a row, he's been eighth both years. This year, he slips to 15th. And I think what cost him is, as each year's gone by, he's had just a few more and a few more poor finishes, very low in the leaderboard. And in 2016, the most ever, with two in the 20s and four finishes in the 30s. And by now, at this point in the show, we've been chatting about these, this incredible mm -hmm. consistency from the individuals ahead of you in the leaderboard. And nowadays, Man, it's just you just can't recover from yeah. something like that unless every other event you had right. was an event win, and that just wasn't the case. But it's just his third appearance at the Games. Young athlete. Again, he's got nothing but time on his side. Yeah, let's go to the other side now. Who are some athletes that really exceeded expectations? Man, I'm going to start with Cole Sager. So, yeah. I mean, this is a guy that barely got into the Games, but then once he showed up, he came to win. He placed fifth at the West Regional. I talked to him on the phone, he said admittedly he didn't take his training seriously enough and he was going to bring it at the games, and he certainly did. 
He's done nothing but improve. 2014 as a rookie, he took 17th. Next year, 7th and now 5th place. And he fought, I mean, he was as low as 24th place and day by day crept his way up the leaderboard until he ended in 5th overall. And then a rookie, yeah. Samuel Quant, this kid, 20 years young. He was fourth place at the West Regional, and I'll be honest with you, never heard of you. Fourth place at the West Regional. I didn't expect much right. from him. He takes 16th place at the games, and he wins double DT against such people as, oh, I don't know, Matt Fraser, <laughs> Ben Smith, Scott Pancheck, Spencer Hendel. Demolishes those guys, so definitely grabbed our attention. Didn't like the deadlift ladder, didn't like the separator, but made money with the barbell. Double DT, squat, clean pyramid, the plow. Super young, man, watch out for him. I was impressed by Travis Mayer. Uh, he's a guy who's made the games twice, but really was kind of trending in the wrong direction in terms of his games placement. He was 18th in 2013, the 29th in 2014, didn't even qualify for the games in 2015. And that was actually in stark contrast to his open performances where he improved from 65th worldwide to 17th worldwide, then to 7th worldwide. So it was nice to see him improve once again. He finished third worldwide in the open, make it to the games. And when he showed up there, we had a chance to talk with him. He seemed like a much more poised and more mature athlete. And that could be in large part to the fact that he's gotten married, had his first kid, some lifestyle factors that play in there. And so for him to show up now and finally make it into the top 10, you're happy for him, and you just hope that that positive trend kind of continues. That is going to do it for us for today. For Tommy Marquez and Pat Sherwood, I'm Sean Woodland. We will back, be back tomorrow to break down the women's competition at the 2016 Reebok CrossFit Games.